This is the um, tenth part in a series entitled That God May Be All in All, The Reconciliation of All Things. I want to talk um, uh, and give some thoughts and comments about theologians and biblical scholars, which I've done a little bit in the past, but this is in a more personal vein. Um, at times in this series, I'll survey what scholars have said, but this series won't consist of a ten tennis match of scholars of, this one says this, and this, and, and, you know, um, he says this, and this is the rebuttal. I mean, part of it out of necessity is so we know what um, damnationists and annihilationists think. I think it's helpful. Today we're going to play some tennis partly for the purpose of exposing some of the fallacious reasoning of scholars and sharpening our critical thinking. Don't be intimidated by someone with a PhD or a THD attached after his or her name. It's like MDs. Are MDs um, uh, gods with white coats? Absolutely not. Some hold scholars in contempt, but scholars, however misguided at times, are people whom God has purchased with the blood of Christ. Although many scholars suffer from hubris and spiritual myopia, they can dig out amazing insights in regard to the meaning of um, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, uh, correlate scripture with ancient history and archaeology, fill out the biblical picture by their understanding of the Dead Sea Scrolls and, and, ver um, and other extra-biblical literature, and exegete details in scripture that most people would not otherwise see. And so, in those senses, I am indebted to many, many scholars. I just uh, realize that sometimes I'm looking for diamonds in a minefield. I just <laughs> ask for the Holy Spirit to expose the minefield so I can find the diamonds. So we owe a, um, a debt to scholars who have labored many years in their respective fields. And I would, uh, as Exhibit A, I would say Joseph Bryant Rotherham with his magisterial and amazing emphasized Bible. It has been a, a, a gift and a boon to many um, because he prizes accuracy. In a letter to his rival, Robert Hooke, Isaac Newton remarked in February 5th, 1675, quote, what, do, what Descartes did was a good step. You have added much several ways, and especially in taking the colors of thin plates into philosophical consideration. If I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants, unquote. And that's why I say we, we owe a certain debt to various scholars, even though we may disagree in some major points. Some discover a gold mine, but they don't know how to dig out the gold, refine it, and shape it. That's what some scholars do. They say, hey, there's a gold mine. I don't know what to do with it, but uh, there it is. From ancient times to the present day, honor and shame form the foundational values of many cultures around the world. Each culture expresses these values in unique ways. I extrapolate from the injunction of honoring one's parents in Exodus 20, 12, to honoring those to whom I am indebted in any sphere of life. Some people have had very abusive parents. I understand that. So all they can honor is the fact of their physical existence. I mean, their upbringing was a, a hell, as it were, and, but they can be thankful that they exist. And so the principle I take is to honor what is honorable and to dishonor what's dishonorable. Uh, eat, the, um, eat the steak and chuck the bone. I consider myself as a beloved son of Abba and the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm a student of Scripture. I, I really, in many ways, don't regard myself as a scholar. Uh, I want to introduce you to... Uh, N.T. Wright, some of you might have heard of him. Uh, I've met him. 
I've read some of his books. Um, he's uh, an amazing British scholar in, in many respects, but he is subject to getting things wrong. I mean, dead wrong. For starters, he's a Trinitarian, so strike one. <laughs> um, N.T. Wright ranks among the top New, New Testament scholars in the world, and he has written a massive two-volume work entitled Paul and the Faithfulness of God. I mean, look at these things. I mean, they're, they're, they're monstrous. And this isn't, these aren't the only works that he has, has composed. I mean, the guy is a workhorse. But I, I make uh, no bones that I disagree with him about the Trinity and many other things. He has written and spoken on a wide variety of topics, including Jesus, Paul, many aspects of New, New Testament studies. Now, just to show you, you know, how you know, crazy things can get, as I said, he believes in um, uh, you know, the Trinity. And you know, at one point, I had an opportunity, opportunity to talk with him at a conference in 2007. And I heard him say, and I thought, man, did he, he just say what I thought he, he said? He, he talked about how he spoke in tongues. And I thought, you know, that's amazing for a scholar to say something like that because many of them reject speaking in tongues. I went up to him afterward and I said, did you say that you, you speak in tongues? And he said, well, yes. Do you have a problem with that? <laughs> so, you know, uh, and so, you know, good for him in that regard. So to be fair, N.T. Wright has many brilliant insights concerning the New Testament and has a comprehensive grasp of primary sources and contemporary biblical scholarship. The question is, does N.T. Wright get it right concerning the meaning of Romans 11.32, which is a primary proof scripture for um, universal salvation? Does he, the, uh, does he hit the bullseye or does he miss the target altogether? He comments thus on this verse, and I'm taking this from one of his books, quote, Paul is not discussing or proposing the issue of universalism, which has haunted 20th century discussions. Again, had he thought his way into such a position, he could have dried his tears and stopped being so sorrowful about his kinsfolk according to the flesh, as well as scrubbing out, as some recent interpreters have tried to do, passages like Romans 2, 1 through 16, unquote. What? <laughs> what, uh, what, kind of, what kind of nonsense from Balderdash has, has uh, issued from his pen? Why would the issue of universalism haunt 20th century discussions? It, it haunts those who believe in eternal damnation or annihilationism. The opposite is true. The specter of the damnation or annihilation of most of humanity has haunted theologians, biblical scholars, and almost every person on earth for centuries, especially since the time of um, Augustine. That's where the real haunting comes from. Some brave hearts have bucked against this dominant portrait of God. Furthermore, when Wright isolates Romans 2, 1 through 16, he's appealing to a passage in which Paul is indicting all of humanity. So it's completely irrelevant. Paul has not yet given the solution to humanity's problem, so Wright's citation of the passage is irrelevant. If Wright understood what Paul is saying in Romans 11.32, he would notice um, the note of rejoicing that follows in Romans 11.33-36. So let's look at these things in context. Notice how Paul launches into praise of God after he makes... Uh, his triumphant declaration in verse 32. So, reading Romans 11, 32 through 36 in the concordant literal uh, translation. For God locks up altogether in stubbornness that he should be merciful to all. 
Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How inscrutable are his judgments and, uh, and untraceable his ways. For who knew the mind of the Lord or who became his advisor? Or who gives to him first that it may be repaid him? Seeing that out of him and through him and for him is all to him be the glory for the eons. Amen. Now can you imagine um, uh, only some, you know, a tiny minority being saved and then Paul waxing eloquent and praising God like this if he knows that um, most of humanity is just, um, you know, trash for the, uh, the burn heap. That's ridiculous. This is absurd. The logical flow of narrative in Paul's mind culminates in God having mercy on all individuals in humanity, and this results in Paul's praise to God for his riches, wisdom, and knowledge in executing this mercy on all humanity. Now, pulpit commentary gets it right initially, but then backtracks. I get so frustrated with some of these commentaries because they get it, and then they, and they pull back, and then they, and they run the car in the ditch. Quote, Tus pontas, meaning the all, in the concluding clause seems to mean generally all mankind, Jews as well as Gentiles. And hinatus pantas um, el ace, 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 that he should be merciful to all. Um, God's embracing all races of mankind at last in the arms of his mercy by calling them into the church. Thus the latter expression is, is not in itself inducible in support of the doctrine of universalism. Unquote. <laughs> Someone get me, uh, 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 I don't know, aspirin or something. With, uh, gives me a headache. Pulpit dodges the plain reading of the text, which is a powerful proof of the salvation of all humanity. Instead, pulpit limits the mercy to all races of mankind brought into the church, even though Paul isn't speaking of the church. The exegetical carnage to Romans 11.32 continues with Expositor's Greek Testament. Quote, to find here a doctrine of universal salvation, dogmatic assertion that every man will at last receive mercy, is simply to desert the ground on which the apostle is standing. It is to leave off thinking about the concrete problem before his mind and to start thinking about something quite different. Unquote. Pulpit misreads Paul because Paul is dogmatically asserting that every person will receive mercy. I mean, five-year-olds and six-year-olds um, who aren't programmed to think in damnationist terms, you know, they, they, would get, they would understand this. Paul stands on the ground of the faith of Christ in Romans 3, 21 through 22, which is... Uh, sufficient for all humanity. Christ's faith is like the, the engine in a train and pulls along all the cars with him. Now let us take the 35,000 foot view of what God is doing with humanity as Paul describes it in Romans 11.32. God um, could have locked up the serpent in Eden and the narrative could have had a quick conclusion. I mean, that's it. However, humanity must be revealed um, as to what it really is in its sinful condition and its lack of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. Humanity thinks it can bring a utopia and a nirvana to the earth, and that mindset is deluding the world as the nations conspire against God and his anointed. We read of this in Psalm 2, 1-3. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers uh, take counsel together against um, Yahweh and his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. Creation also needs to see this. God does 
does this over a long period of time, showing humanity is ineptitude. In his commentary on Romans, Thomas Schreiner says, quote, some scholars conclude that either universalism is taught here or it is not ruled out since the text says that God shut all uh, to disobedience in order to extend his mercy upon Pontus. In, in other words, um, all, unquote. Schreiner dodges the plain meaning and wrongly concludes that the second all refers to Jews and Gentiles as groups. Let's, now let's turn to the Lutheran scholar Lenski. He dogmatically asserts, quote, Tus Pontus, that is, them all, every group among those of whom Paul is speaking, those Gentiles and those Jews who in this equal disobedience are brought to faith and salvation by God's equal mercy. This is not a final grand generality which states that all Gentiles and all Jews uh, are disobedient sinners and, and that God sent his mercy for all. <laughs> Unquote. So Lenski gets it wrong, a swing and a miss. Similarly, in his commentary, Brendan Byrne, a Catholic scholar, says that Romans 11.32, in, in Romans 11.32, Paul has a communal view that both Jews and Gentiles, not all human beings in an individual sense. Are Lenski and Byrne correct um, that those in this chapter are limited uh, to certain Jews and Gentiles? Let's dig deeper in Romans 11. All Israel is in view early in the chapter. Verse 2, God does not thrust away his people whom he foreknew. Uh, verse 5, that Thus then, in the current era also, there has come to be a remnant according to the choice of grace. Romans 11.5 shows that there is a remnant of literal Israelites who recognize Jesus as a Messiah. And it, examples are found in Acts 6.7. Um, and the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Acts 21.20. And when they heard it, they glorified God, and they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands are among the Jews of those who have believed. They are all zealous for the law. So there, there was a remnant of, of Jews who uh, believed Jesus was Messiah. Then Romans eleven seven. What then? What Israel is seeking for, this she did not encounter. Yet the chosen encountered it. Now the rest were uh, callous. And then verse 26, And thus all Israel shall be saved, according as it is written, Arriving out of Zion shall be the rescuer, he shall be uh, turning away your reverence from Jacob. All Israel is a phrase that encompasses all of Israel. And we read of this in um, Zechariah 12, 10 through 14, which is a prophecy of the all-encompassing aspect of Israel's salvation at the second coming. All Israel points to the ultimate salvation of Israel as a nation living at the time of the second coming, forming a contrast to the present remnant that Paul mentioned earlier. The context also in Romans 11 shows that Paul's scope concerns the entire world. In Romans 11:15, we read, For if they're casting away as a conciliation of the world, what will be the taking back be, if not life from among the dead. The focus is on the nations of which the believers in Rome were uh, a part. For even as, verse 30, for even as you were once stubborn toward God, yet now we're shown mercy at their stubbornness. So we see um, it's not just select portions. He's talking about all of Israel and the entire world. Uh, Jameson Fawcett Brown says, quote, Certainly it is not all mankind individually, for the apostle is not here dealing with individuals, but with those great divisions of mankind, Jew and Gentile, unquote. See how they try to wiggle out of the, of the plain meaning of the text. Alfred gets it right in seeing that all, that all refers to all humanity, but... Um, he then inserts the contingency of people's response. These things are amazing to me. Quote, 
Um, but there remains some question. Who are the hoi pontes, that is the all, of both clauses? Are they the same? The answer is yes. And if so, is any support given to the notion of a apocatastasis uh, uh, of all men, that is, you know, the restoration of all men? Certainly they are identical and signify all men without limitation. Uh, he's moving in the right direction. But the ultimate difference between the all men who are shut up under disobedience and the all men upon whom mercy is shown is that by the all men, this mercy is not accepted. And so men become self-excluded from the salvation of God. God's act remains the same, equally gracious, equally universal, whether men accept his mercy or not. This contingency is here, is here not in view, but simply God's act itself, unquote. Alfred rightly sees that uh, this bestowal of mercy is God's sovereign act, but he invents an ingenious way of bulldozing the wall of logic down to rubble. Which person in his right, in his or her right mind, would exclude himself or herself from the glory of God in heaven and then in the new heaven and the new earth? I mean, they posit, um, you know, they, they have this all powerful human will that can somehow stiff arm God. When Alfred says, so men became self excluded from the salvation of God, he makes a dogmatic assertion by appealing to man's so-called free will, which must be uh, more powerful than the will of God. In the plain declaration of Paul, the will of God stipulates the salvation of all people and their realization of the truth. 1 Timothy 2, 4. I have more, um, and I think this is where I will, I will stop. But I hope this is helpful at some degree to know this, this back and forth, the games that scholars play, so you're not intimidated by some of these people. Yeah, sometimes I, I derive a lot of benefit from some of these scholars. Uh, some of them can run circles around me, but when push comes to shove in some of the major areas, is God one or is he three and one? And you know they say, no, he's three and one. Does he save all? Or just a few? A few? Really? Um, and so um, these are things, um, I mean, you're light years ahead of some of these scholars. You may not realize that, but the revelation of God will always trump the traditions of people. And that is the plain and simple and Amen. profound truth. Amen. Amen.